I am a 34-year-old female, but this event occurred when I was 21 and studying abroad. I was based out of Italy, but I convinced my parents to let me backpack for a few weeks to other major destinations in Europe. To prep, I read a few books and articles about traveling safely alone and even watched the Liam Neeson film Taken right before I left, just for good measure. My travels took me to Paris. I had dinner near the opera house. As I left the restaurant, I noticed a group of six men behind me, heading in the same direction. I wasn't overly concerned at first. This is Paris after all. There are a lot of people walking everywhere. However, I noticed that these six men were following me less than 20 feet behind and were taking all the same turns. They all spoke in an Eastern European accent, similar to my limited exposure to Russian. After about 10 minutes, they were aware that I noticed them and attempted to engage me in conversation with cat calls and general questions, all spoken in English. I was beginning to get nervous, so I decided to pretend that I didn't understand what they were saying. Immediately, they switched to speaking in French, which I don't speak at all. After another 15 minutes or so of walking several city blocks, nowhere close to the bed and breakfast I was staying at, the men were now following me at 5 to 10 feet, ensuring they were all but impossible to ignore. I began to panic, and I decided to use a non-native language that I knew best, Italian. In addition to pretending that I didn't speak English, ignoring the French, and trying to stay calm, I began to speak back to them in Italian, using phrases such as, I'm sorry, I don't speak French. I don't understand what you're saying. Is there something I can help you with? I am a fair-skinned blonde with blue eyes. They could probably tell that I was certainly not Italian. But after 15 minutes of following me and being stonewalled by a language they luckily couldn't understand, they began to close in and walked close enough to reach out and grab me. I was at a complete loss of what to do, but I forged ahead with feigned confidence, hiding my inner panic by acting more confused and concerned toward them. If I turned down an unpopulated street, I have no doubt they would have tried to abduct me. The sun was already beginning to set, and I was nowhere near my intended destination. Asking someone for help would shatter my facade of being Italian. I didn't know the city well enough to find a police station. I was running out of options. If I ran, at least one of the six would likely be able to catch me. I began walking up and down the same major street, with restaurants and tourists everywhere. I did not want to leave this area, and I was hoping that the obvious repetition might catch the attention of someone that could help me. Finally, after an hour of being tailed and stubbornly refusing to show my obvious fear, they abruptly stopped following me and began walking down another street. Did they decide that I was too much trouble? Or were they now hiding at different intervals and possible paths that I would take back? Shaking with anxiety and tension, I walked a nonsensical route back to my room, which took me about 45 minutes. Once I entered, I began sobbing at the front desk, explaining to the clerk what had been happening. He locked the front doors and carried my bags to stay in a room with an earshot of the front desk, but out of view of the front door. My advice is that if you're ever traveling alone, you must always be vigilant and aware of your surroundings. Listen to your instincts and assume a natural suspicion of anyone who's acting suspiciously. Try and stay calm no matter what. Try to keep a level head and think of your next move. Most importantly, please don't let anyone following you see where you're staying for the night. I live in a very rural area of New Brunswick, Canada. It was early September, and it was my first day of school. 
I unfortunately was held back in my senior year, so I would be returning to high school as a 19 year old. Since we lived in a very isolated area, the middle and high school shared the same building. I had study hall for first period. However, when I entered, I noticed that there was a new student on the other side of the room. He stood out because like I said, it was a small community. I walked over to him and introduced myself. We shook hands and he told me that his name was Chester. Apparently he had just moved to the area. Being the friendly Canadian that I am, I showed him around the school and where his next class was. As I was giving him a tour, I noticed that he seemed a bit off. He began to ask me questions. At first, they seemed harmless, like how long I had been there, or where a certain classroom was. But then, he began asking me some questions that seemed odd. He then asked me for my home address and Snapchat. And yes, it was as awkward as it sounds. I was completely taken off guard by this. I did not give him my home address, but I thought what harm could it do to give him my Snapchat? A decision that I would later regret. When the last period of the day came, I had English class. There were only nine students in that class. I took a seat, and that's when I looked behind me and saw Chester. He didn't notice me right away. He was too busy making out with a sandwich. It was disgusting. He looked up and noticed me. Imagine that you're present at a murder trial, and the defendant turns around and looks directly at you. That should give you an idea of how uncomfortable I felt. He then gestured for me to walk over to him. Class was about to start, so I just ignored him. Five minutes later, I look up from my book, and I notice that Chester is now staring daggers at me. The look in his eyes was predatory. He must have saw me as the next sandwich he was going to devour. Again, he gestured for me to walk over to him. Fuck that noise. I know an underwear sniffing weirdo when I see one. I ignored him and continued reading my book. Then my phone pinged. It was a Snapchat message. Of course, it was from Chester. Follow me. I replied, We're in the middle of class right now. He got it from his table and asked the teacher if he could use the bathroom. He then walked out into the hall. I wanted to see why he wanted me to follow him. So, about five minutes passed, and I asked the teacher if I could use the bathroom as well. When I exited the classroom, I saw that Chester was about 50 feet away, walking very slowly. This guy was weird. I mean, just fucking weird. I kept at a distance behind him, so he wouldn't know I was there. He then turned down the hallway that led to some storage rooms and the basement. I saw him open a door, walk inside, and closed it behind him. Confused, I walked over to the door he walked through, and I recognized it as the entrance to the school's basement. There was no way in hell I was following him down there. I just casually walked back to class. When I sat back down, my phone pinged again. Why didn't you enter the basement? Okay, so now I'm thoroughly creeped out by this guy. I just replied, Look, uh, just leave me alone. You creep me the hell out. I then blocked him. When I got home that day, I immediately started on my homework. By the time I was all done, it was around 11 p.m. and I was all by myself. I was putting all my stuff away when I received a new Snapchat notification. Someone had added me as a friend, but it was from an account called, Why Didn't You Enter the Basement? I knew it was Chester, so I blocked it. Not even 30 seconds later, I got another request. This time, the account was called, Why Did You Block Me? I blocked that one as well. Then another one came in. This time, it was even more ominous. 
I know where you live. Followed by, I am right outside your house. I then heard a window break downstairs. I immediately called the cops and told them what was happening. The operator said to find somewhere to hide and lock the door. I hung up and went into the hallway closet. My worst nightmare came true as I heard footsteps moving up the stairs. The closet that I was hiding in overlooked the staircase. I then saw a dark figure appear. As it moved into the light, I saw him. It was Chester. As soon as he reached the top of the stairs, he made his way to the middle of the hallway and then stopped. He then looked directly at the closet I was hiding in. It was like I was in a horror film. I didn't want to freak out and give away that I was hiding in that closet, so I retreated further in, concealing myself behind some thick winter coats. Chester then opened the door and peered inside. He couldn't seem to find the light switch and eventually gave up. After moving from room to room, I heard his footsteps descending back down the stairs. A few minutes later, the police knocked on the front door. I immediately left the closet and went downstairs and opened it up, and told them what was happening. Of course, by the time that they arrived, Chester was nowhere to be found. After they searched the house, they determined that he escaped through a window in my basement. I showed the police the Snapchat activity, and they said that they would do their best to track him down. The next school day, I went to the principal's office to report Chester. Snitches get stitches my ass. Plus, Chester was seriously disturbed. I sincerely believe that he was a threat to both myself and the other students. But here is the creepiest part of the story. My principal told me that there was no new student named Chester. He must have snuck into the school somehow and blended in with the other kids and none of the staff bothered to confirm that he was actually a new student. Thankfully, he was never seen again, and I never heard any follow-up from the police either. To this day, I still think about what would have happened to me if I had followed him into the school basement. I might have been his next sandwich. In early September, I started my senior year of high school. I was a bit of a loner, and usually kept to myself. I lived in a very rural area in northern Washington state, so it took me some time to drive to school. During my second period of class, there was a student named Keith. I didn't really know him that well, but he never really seemed to bother anyone before. I noticed that Keith was staring at me. I was at the far right desk in the front row. He mouthed a few words to me, but I could not understand what he was trying to tell me. As the day went on, I would occasionally see him in the hallways, giving me nasty looks. I tried my best to ignore him, but something about this guy seemed disturbing. Finally, it was the last period of the day, and I was about to leave. However, I stopped dead in my tracks when I noticed Keith at the end of the hall staring right at me. I acted like I didn't see him and tried to blend in with a crowd of students who were leaving, but as I walked out the door, he watched me get into my car. I remember looking into my rearview mirror to see him standing by the parking lot, watching me as I drove away. By the time I got home, I had forgotten all about Keith's strange behavior. Later that night, I received a text from an unknown number. I know where you live. I didn't know what to think, so I ignored it, thinking that it was a spam message and continued working on my homework. A while later, I received another text. This time, it was more alarming. It was a picture of me walking into my school. 
The number then sent another picture of me in the school hallway. Both of the photographs were taken from behind. Another message then came in. It was my home address. My parents weren't home at the time, so I quickly shut off all the lights in the house and closed the blinds. The last window I got to was in the living room. I briefly looked outside to see a silhouette standing in my front yard. It was too dark to see who it was, but I closed the curtains and made my way to the basement and waited. An eerie silence settled in, as if something could happen at any moment. The silence was disrupted by the sound of the front door handle being turned. Thankfully it was locked, but the fact that someone was trying to get inside was terrifying. Five minutes later I heard footsteps above me. Whoever was outside had found a way inside. I quickly hid under an old desk. I should have called the cops when I had the chance. I guess I didn't really think someone would actually break in. And now, I didn't want to give away my hiding spot. My worst fears came true when I heard the basement door creak open. I could see the light from the upstairs hallway shine in for a split second before it was switched off, plunging the basement into darkness again. It was now silent and pitch black. I then heard a voice speak. It was Keith. I know you are down there. I can see you. Come out now. I didn't know if he was bluffing, so I didn't move. He then slowly walked down the stairs and made his way around the room. I could hear him knocking things over and getting closer and closer. He then stopped directly in front of the desk. My heart was pounding a mile a minute. All went silent again until Keith spoke. Well, I gave you a chance to make this easy, but now you've really pissed me off. At this point, my eyes adjusted to the dark, and I could see that Keith was holding a hammer in his right hand. Without thinking, I sprung up from under the desk and shoved Keith, sending him backwards, and then made a beeline to the basement stairs. You fucking bitch! I'm going to kill you! I heard something flying across the room and smashing into the old TV by the staircase. I would later find out that he threw the hammer. As soon as I got upstairs, I slammed the basement door shut and locked it, then ran out the front door. Let me out! I'll bash your brains in! I immediately called the police and then my parents. I heard sirens in the distance. When the cops pulled up, I told them that he was locked inside the basement. When they entered the house and opened the basement door, Keith was gone. He escaped by smashing out a window. It turns out that I had forgotten to lock the side door, which is how Keith got inside. I told the police who Keith was and showed them the disturbing messages I received earlier. Two days later, I was called to the principal's office. I was told that Keith had been arrested and would never be allowed back to school again. Thankfully, I never saw him after that. As far as Keith's motives were, he may have had some kind of psychotic meltdown and decided to act on a preconceived obsession of me. It's truly scary. One day he seemed so unassuming, and the next, he was in my basement trying to kill me with a hammer. I'm going to start this story with some background. I'm a 26-year-old male living in Tennessee near the Great Smoky Mountains. I've been a fan of Uncle Unit for a few years now, but I've never really wanted to share the story of mine, mainly because it genuinely disturbs me to no end and has mentally scarred me. 
in order to move on with my life, I just had to put it out of my head for a while. But after watching some videos on this channel and doing some serious self-reflection, I've decided to share this and let all of you judge it for yourselves. This happened a year after I graduated high school. I had just started working at a local convenience store, one town over from where I lived. I had been there about a month and a half. And one night, I was working later than usual because the employee who was supposed to relieve me never showed up. I called up my manager to tell him that the employee never showed. He wasn't really surprised because he had been having issues with that guy and expected him to quit sooner or later. I'm really sorry about this, but I'm going to need you to stay until closing time and lock the place up when you're done. Call me if you need anything. It was no big deal for me. I actually liked working by myself most of the time. The store usually stayed open until around 9.30 or 10, depending on if we had customers in the store or not. I was cleaning up one of the aisles in the back of the store after helping some customers. I had one earbud in my ear, listening to an audiobook on my phone, when I heard the front door open. So I walked to the front counter to see if this person needed any help. Only one problem. I didn't see anyone. At first, I thought they may have walked directly to the bathroom, since it was right next to the entrance. But after waiting about 10 to 15 minutes, I finally walked over to see if it was locked. To my surprise, it wasn't. In fact, it was slightly cracked open, with the light turned off. I opened the bathroom and flipped on the light. There was no one in there. Right then, I felt uneasy. So I looked back out into the store to see if anyone else was there. I even called out. Hello? Is there anyone there? No answer. I was starting to think either I was just getting tired or there was something wrong with the door chimes. I decided to ignore it and go back to cleaning. About an hour and a half later, the door chimes again. So I walked back to the front, and again, no one was there. I started thinking to myself that there had to be something wrong with the door chimes. So I left a note on the register to tell my boss the next day. A few minutes later, the door chime goes off again. I look up towards the front of the store to see that the door is actually open this time. So I quickly made my way to the front counter. But when I got there, of course, there was no one there. I knew for sure that I had watched the door open when the chimes went off. I checked the bathroom again and walked down all of the aisles. A chill went down my spine. Not at what I saw, but what I didn't see. There wasn't a soul in sight. I couldn't understand what was happening, so I decided that I was going to stand by the front counter until my shift ended. I had about 45 minutes left. 20 minutes go by of me hanging out by the counter when someone actually came in. Uh, good evening. I said to them nervously. The person that came in was wearing an old winter coat with a black hood on their head. This wasn't out of the ordinary because it was 40 degrees out that night. The person didn't respond to my greeting. I figured that they couldn't hear me for some reason, and I didn't think too much of it. Maybe they had a pair of headphones on under their hood or something. They walked to the back of the shop. Since closing time was coming up, I began to clean the counter. About 20 minutes later, I realized that the guy never came back to pay for anything. I looked around the store and saw that there was no one there. This was a small privately owned store that didn't have much in the way of security, and the area it was located in saw little to no crime. We had one camera facing the front door and one in the parking lot. I yelled out, Hey, are you finding everything okay? but I got no response. Look, I'm closing in about 10 minutes. Is there something I can help you with? Again, no response. I walked to the back of the store where I last saw the person, 
another chill was sent up my back when I saw that one of the fridge doors was open, but there was no sign of the person in the jacket. I closed the fridge door and walked up and down every aisle, and I didn't see anyone. I was creeped out before, but now I was full on freaking out. So I decided at that point that I would walk back up to the front and call my boss. Hello? Hey, it's me. Something weird is going on here. What do you mean? So, there was this guy in a jacket that came in about 30 minutes ago. I saw him heading towards the fridge section in the back. He was taking a while, and when I went back to go check on him, he wasn't there. Okay, give me a second. I'll look at the cameras. Let me see if he left the building. I also mentioned to my boss about how the door chime had been going off for the past couple of hours, even when there wasn't anyone in the store. Uh, that's strange. You didn't see anyone come in at all? No, not till this guy in the jacket came in. After a minute of my boss looking through the camera feeds, he tells me something that messes with my head to this day. Are you absolutely sure somebody came into the store? I'm reviewing the clips in the past two hours, and you're the only person that appears in them. I felt a knot form in the pit of my stomach. What do you mean I'm the only one in the video? Look, I'm telling you that you're the only person in the store walking back and forth from the aisles to the counter for the past two hours. This was when I started to second guess myself. Did I really see someone coming into the store? I took a long look around the store. And I thought that maybe I was just getting tired. Uh, look, I'm sorry. I haven't been sleeping very well lately. It's okay. Just go ahead and lock up for the night and go home and get some rest. Sound advice. I began to close everything up, putting all the money in the safe, cleaning up the counters, etc. That's when I heard laughing coming from the back of the store. <laughs> it really wasn't a haha -ha funny kind of laugh. It was more of a sinister chuckle. I stopped what I was doing and looked up to see that the fridge door was open again. Now, we kept a baseball bat behind the counter, just as a precaution. None of us ever had to use it before. But I grabbed the bat and wielded it like a saber as I advanced toward the back of the store. The fridge door being open again was the least of my worries. A hooded figure was standing just beyond the open door. Holy shit! How long have you been back there? The figure did not answer. I gripped the bat tighter. Hey man, are you alright? That's when a deep, raspy voice replied. I'm thirsty. Okay, is there something I can help you find? I'm about to close up. <laughs> I heard the chuckle again, and I began slowly backing away. Something was off about this guy. I don't know if he was on drugs or what. Look, I've got to lock up now. How about you just grab a drink, come on up, and I'll get you out of here, okay? The man just stood there. The reflection from the opened fridge door and his hood made it impossible for me to see his face. I decided that it wasn't a good idea to engage him any further, and I retreated back to the counter, grabbed my phone, and immediately called my boss back. He answered after the first ring. Hey, that guy I said was in here earlier is now standing by the fridge right now. He's just standing there chuckling like some kind of lunatic, and I can't get him to leave. What should I do? My boss went silent for a moment, before asking. What does he look like? I don't know, he has this black hood on under an old winter jacket, with a pair of jeans and some black shoes. His hood is hiding his face, so I can't really see it. Shit. Alright. Hang on. I'm on my way to the store. Stay on the line until I get there. Why? What's the deal? Just stay on the line until I get there. Watch that guy and see what he does. If he doesn't leave within the next few minutes and I'm still not there, I want you to call the cops on the store phone. So I waited by the front counter for my boss to arrive. He lived about five minutes down the road. While I was on the phone with him... I heard the fridge door slam shut, 
followed by a loud crash at the back of the store. I nearly jumped out of my skin. The next thing I knew, I heard the sound of someone rushing up towards the counter, but I couldn't see anyone. After a moment, the noise stopped. Hey, you still there? What's going on? Yeah, I'm here. I thought I heard someone running toward me. I don't know what's going on here. This guy keeps disappearing. I'll be there as soon as I can. I want you to call the cops. I quickly set my phone on the counter and started dialing 911 on the store phone. I then heard another chuckle. <laughs> and I looked up to see the hooded man standing in front of the counter. I jumped back, almost taking a swing at him with a bat. I finally saw the man's face. There was something very wrong about its appearance. It wasn't just that he was creepy, but his appearance was unnatural looking. It looked like his face was a botched photoshop job. It didn't really look real. A wide crooked smile then spread across his fake face. It reminded me of that old Grinch Christmas cartoon that I used to watch as a kid. The man's eyes seemed to flicker back and forth between pale and pitch black. It was like I was looking into a void of television static. That's when I yelled. Whatever the hell you are, leave my store. Now. The thing then began laughing. <laughs> but I'm thirsty. I raised the bat into the air, ready to swing if the man came any closer. I heard my boss yelling at me through my cell phone. Hey, what's going on? A few seconds later, I heard a car pull up outside into the parking lot. I glanced over to the window to see who it was. The second I took my eyes off the hooded man, he sprinted out of the store. A moment later, my boss came rushing in. Hey, are you okay? Yes, I'm fine. You just missed him. You didn't see him running out of the front door? No, I didn't see anyone come out. Are you serious? The guy just ran out of here right before you came in. My boss swore up and down that he didn't see anybody. The cops were called, and the security footage was reviewed. It showed somebody in a black hood leaving the store right before my boss came in. After everything was said and done, the cops told me that they would keep an eye out for the guy. The camera didn't show his face, so they couldn't get an exact physical description of him. I tried to give him all the details that I could, but it wasn't much to go off of. Plus, the guy technically didn't commit any crimes. My boss and I cleaned up the store and locked the place up. He then told me to go home and take a couple of days off. That was the last time I worked the late shift by myself. As far as I know, the police never caught up with the hooded man. Personally, I feel like it was either someone with serious mental issues, in which case I hope he found help. But if he was something else, something that can't be so easily explained, well, I hope I never see that thing again. I was around 19 or 20 when this occurred. I was living in a small apartment with my best friend, Mason, at the time. The front door was about two to four feet from his bedroom door, while mine was down the hallway toward the back of the apartment. One morning at around 3 a.m., I woke to some heavy knocking on our front door. My dog instinctively reacted and began barking. At first, I ignored it thinking that it was an estranged family member of mine I wanted nothing to do with. That's a story for another time. I also knew that I shouldn't open the door to anyone this late, as we were on the first floor of our apartment building. The knocking continued, so I grabbed a knife and walked to the door. I looked through the peephole to see a girl in her late teens on the other side. She was dressed nicely, like she had been to a club or bar hopping. We were about five miles from the University of Central Florida, so it wasn't uncommon for college kids to be out and about. With much trepidation, 
I opened the door and I asked the girl what she wanted. She explained that she came here with a guy who started acting very strange and she needed help. I was about to ask if she wanted me to call the police when we both heard a door open and slam shut on the level above us, followed by someone barreling down the staircase near my front door. We both looked to the stairs at the end of the hallway, listening to the booming footsteps descending. The girl panicked and pushed past me into my apartment. I then quickly locked my door. I brought her into our living room. I was now flustered that I had been thrusted into this situation against my will. But whatever. I guess if things were reversed, I'd want someone to help me out too. And I felt better after hitting my bong. Thankfully, no one came to the door. The girl was still very upset and asked me through tears if I would walk her back to her car. I said sure, and I would bring my dog, Caddy, along with me, who is a pit bull Rottweiler mix who would bite someone's ass cheek off if they tried anything. I leashed my dog and we walked to the parking lot, which was not too far away from my building. I watched the girl get into her car, and she thanked me before closing the door and driving away. The next morning I asked Mason if he had heard all the commotion. I didn't hear anything at all, dude. I slept soundly through the night. When I told him what happened, he didn't believe me at first and even teased me. You're so full of shit. You probably dreamed up that scenario from all those bong hits. I started second guessing the whole thing. But deep down, I know that it happened. The stuff I smoke is good, but it's not that good. I still have no idea what the guy on the second level looked like or what his intentions with that girl were. But I like to think that I saved that girl from being assaulted, or worse. My name is Riley. I'm 17 now. But this story happened when I was 9. I was on a camping trip with my sister Lynn, who was 10, and my cousin Joanne, who was also 9. My grandparents were camping enthusiasts, so they wanted to take all of us on our first camping trip. I had very bad separation anxiety from my mom when I was growing up, and this was my first time going somewhere without her, so I wasn't too happy about the whole thing. Luckily, we were only going to be gone for 3 days. The site had about 150 lots to set up camp. The day we got there, there were about 15 of the lots taken. We went there two weeks after school started, so it wasn't that busy. The first night we got to the campground, Lynn, Joanne, and I went on a walk around the entire campsite while our grandparents set up the trailer. On our walk, we saw a white kitten sitting on the gravel, just looking up at us. We all tried to pet it, but it ran off down a side trail that we hadn't noticed. We followed it, and it brought us to a small abandoned playground behind the trees. It looked like something out of Silent Hill. There was a tall metal slide, four swings, a jungle gym, and two of those pig and horse seesaws. We didn't want to miss out on dinner, so we noted the playground's location and returned to the camper. The next day we went to the lake and swam until around 5 p.m. After we ate dinner, we were all sitting outside of the camper just chilling when Lynn popped up in her seat and said, Hey, let's go check out that playground we saw yesterday. Joanne and I thought it was a good idea. It was the perfect temperature out that night. Not too hot, but not too cold. We got on our shoes and made our way to the old playground. It took us about five minutes to get halfway there, since this campground had long trails, and we weren't really in a big hurry. We all suddenly stopped. That same white kitten was sitting on the path. We all got real quiet to not scare it off, and then we heard a twig snap behind us. We all looked back to see a girl who was around our age. She had on a short white dress and had curly brown hair. We didn't feel like hanging out with someone that we didn't know, so we just kept walking without saying anything to her. I would look back every few minutes to see her following us, but I thought that she might be heading back to the campsite. 
We ended up making it to the playground and hung out there for about an hour. We were on the swing sets, and there was a six-foot fence on the back side of the playground, with a lake on the other side. We were all enjoying the view of the water and sunset when we heard another twig breaking somewhere off in the forest. We all stopped swinging, trying to see if there was anyone nearby. I ended up looking towards the slide and seeing that same girl from earlier hiding under it. I was startled. I told Lynn and Joanne that we should start heading back to the camper, since it was getting dark. They agreed. I didn't mention the girl hiding under the slide. Once we walked down the trail and were heading back towards the campers, I looked back one last time to see that same girl standing at the edge of the forest, watching us. Once we got back to our camper, we didn't see anyone around the campsite. It was practically a ghost town. Once inside, we noticed that our grandparents were nowhere to be found. We peeked out of the windows, and we realized that everything was quiet. There was no chatter from the other campers. There were no dogs barking, no kids running around, no music playing. Everything was just silent. This was unsettling. Because of our young age, none of us had cell phones to call for help. We all just sat in our beds, not saying anything. We were supposed to leave early the next morning, so we decided to call in a night, hoping that our grandparents would show up at some point. When we all woke up, Lynn stepped outside to see if anyone was there. But just like the day before, there wasn't a soul in sight. She came back inside and we locked the door, and we all started crying, hoping that this nightmare would just come to an end. We went on the whole day without leaving the trailer, and we eventually went back to bed. I woke up some time later to hear a bunch of police sirens and people talking outside. I got up to see what it was, and I immediately saw my mom getting out of her car, surrounded by at least eight police cars. She instantly ran right up to me and hugged me. We were all confused about what was happening, and everyone just told us that our grandparents had gotten lost. But a few years later, when I got older, I discovered the truth about what happened. My grandparents and the 15 other families on that camping site disappeared without a trace. No one knows what happened to them. The police were notified by multiple other family members when they didn't hear from their relatives at the campsite. I'm still not sure why nothing happened to us that day. Whatever caused those people and my grandparents to disappear must have occurred while we were at the playground. Deep down, I believe that little girl we saw was a guardian angel protecting us. That campsite's reputation never recovered from this incident and it ended up shutting down shortly after. The mystery of the vanishing campers has never been solved. Two weeks ago, I wanted to take a walk around town after I got off work. I had about an hour of sunlight left, and I wanted to be home to do some housework before it got dark. It was about at the midway point that I saw someone following me. It was a man wearing work gloves, sunglasses, and a ball cap. It didn't really concern me at first, because sometimes I see other people during my walks, even around this time. However, it was still quite warm out, and I thought it was strange that he was wearing so much. During my walks, I sometimes like taking photos of the sky or interesting tree formations, the scenic kind of stuff. After I was done snapping a photo of the evening sky, I noticed that the man had also stopped and was watching me as I took the picture. I tried to be positive and thought that perhaps he was also looking at something. I continued on, but I deliberately slowed down, and he did the same. I felt my heart begin to beat faster, but I didn't want to panic. The town I live in is quite rural surrounded by forest on all sides, plenty of space to hide a body. 
On the other hand, this was the kind of place where people left their bikes unlocked and their front doors open. It was refreshing for me when I first moved here. Although, since I arrived, things have changed. I've noticed new faces showing up, like the man following me that night, and it seems that the more populated this place became, the more crime took place. What once felt like a sanctuary was now quite uncomfortable for me, and even before what happened that night, I had already made the decision to move out at the end of the month. I quickly made my way through a cluster of trees and onto another street, and saw a few people out and about, so I felt safer. I looked behind me and saw the man walking through the trees. Seeing him frightened me, but I needed to keep my composure and ask someone for assistance. He continued to tail me as I went down a couple of side streets. I eventually stopped at a community pond. Soon my pursuer emerged. There was no mistaking it now. He didn't just happen to be walking down the same streets I was, and I was just being paranoid. He was targeting me. I was on the other side of the pond when he approached. He never took his eyes off of me as he took a seat on a park bench that was next to the pond. I was barely holding it together. I left the pond, making sure I took another path to avoid the man, and soon I found myself outside of one of the only restaurants in town. During all the commotion, I forgot that this place was near the pond. I saw two women walking their dogs, and I went to them and asked them for help. As I explained everything to them, the man came around the corner. When he spotted me, he came strolling towards me while I stayed behind the two women. One of them spoke directly to him. Hey, are you bothering this woman? You better leave her alone, weirdo. Thankfully, the man simply walked past us and disappeared down the street. Afterward, I accompanied the two women as they walked their dogs. It turns out that they were passing by my place anyways. I never saw that man again, and I avoided going for walks around town after work for the remainder of my time there. There's no telling what would have happened to me if I hadn't been vigilant that night. What did he want from me? What did he plan on doing? These are frightening thoughts. I'm considering taking self-defense courses in case something like this happens again. When I was about 12, my great uncle John came from Ukraine to visit us in Canada. He had a lot of stories, but this is the one that stood out. In the late 1960s, John was traveling by train from his village to another to visit family. He had to change trains at some point, and was dropped off at what amounted to a platform and a hut in the middle of nowhere. There was no one else at the station, other than a dirt road that led off into the surrounding forest. There was nothing there. He waited for some time, but no train came. This was winter time, and it was getting colder and darker. And just about the time he started worrying about a place to stay and some food to eat, an old woman appeared out of the twilight. She asked him if he was waiting for a train to come, and when he said yes, she said that it wouldn't be a long until the following day. She then asked if he needed a bed for the night, and offered him a meal and a room at her house, which she said was about an hour's walk from the station. Lodging with locals was more or less the standard when traveling in this part of the USSR and Uncle John wasn't looking forward to a hungry night on a cold platform. So he graciously accepted her offer. He took his suitcase and they set off together down the dark road that led into the forest. It was more than an hour away, more like two, and by the time that they arrived at the woman's small two-story house, John was tired and hungry. They went inside and the woman lit up some oil lamps and warmed up some borscht for them. It was the first time that John was able to see the woman clearly, and he was a bit startled to realize that the old woman was actually a man. Not wanting to pry and too tired to care, John finished up his soup and asked where he would be sleeping. 
She led him up the stairs to a tiny room that had a window and a single bed and nothing else. He thanked her and said goodnight, and she closed the door, locking it behind her, leaving him in complete darkness. Somewhat creeped out by this, John called to her, but she didn't answer and heard nothing else, figuring that he would deal with it in the morning and she had probably done it by accident, John set his suitcase down and laid on the bed, deciding that he would make the best of it. Before he could fall asleep though, he felt the urge to pee. He got out of bed, hoping to find a chamber pot or something that he could piss in, and got on his hands and knees and began to feel under the bed in the darkness, thinking that if there was a pot, that's where it would be. Instead, he found a body. Uncle John stood up and went right to the window to see if he could exit the room that way, but it was nailed shut. He knew that if he remained in that room, he would be a dead man by morning. But if he broke the window and tried to escape, there was a good chance that the old woman and God knows who else would hear him. So he did the only thing that he could do. He pulled the body from under the bed, heaved it onto the mattress, and covered it with the blanket. He then got under the bed and waited. Sure enough, about an hour later, he heard footsteps slowly coming up the stairs and then toward the room. When the lock clicked, the knob slowly turned. In the gloom, John saw someone move toward the bed. He then heard several sickening thuds. The assailant had bashed the body on the bed with a large crowbar, which they then dropped on the floor right in front of John. There was silence. The door was then shut again. The footsteps then descended back down the stairs. John moved out from under the bed, took the crowbar, and was able to slowly pry the window open. He didn't say, but I imagine he was shitting bricks the entire time. When the window was up, he threw the suitcase out, then dove through himself, not caring what was below him. He was only worried about what was inside the house. He landed without much injury, and began to run into a field behind the house, toward some lights he saw in the distance. It turned out to be a highway with some military trucks on it. John was able to hitch a ride to another village, where he would catch a train. He didn't bother reporting what happened to the authorities, since at the time in the USSR, there was a distinct chance that he would have been the one who got into trouble. He just thanked God that he was able to escape, and decided that the next time he traveled to visit relatives, he would take another way. This happened two summers ago, while I was house-sitting out in California for an older couple I had met at a conference for work. It seemed like a dream scenario. The couple wanted to go vacationing in Hawaii for two weeks, but didn't want to board their cats. I had been chatting with them about wanting to visit California again. I loved it the first time I went and we figured that we could mutually benefit one another if I came out and house sat for them. So I flew out there, and they showed me around for a few days, taught me how to care for their cats, there were two of them, one was extremely shy, who I barely ever saw, which will be important later on. They also showed me how to take care of their plants. They gave me access to their house and cars. These people were very generous. And before I knew it, I had dropped them off at the airport, and I was on my own. At first, it was the dream vacation. I was staying in Oakland, and was making forays into San Francisco, Sonoma, and Monterey. In the mornings, I would walk out of the front door, and shortly would be hiking in the pass surrounding the nearby Mount Diablo, and I would just be ultra content with the world. I was so enamored by the area that I actually started looking into taking some steps to relocate out there. 
But then one day, about halfway through my final week there, when I got back to the house, I felt very odd. Almost like I shouldn't go inside. I shook it off and went inside anyway, because it was getting late and I needed to feed the cats. Once I was inside, I forced myself to ignore how off it felt, and I made some dinner for myself, went to bed, and was shocked to find that the shy cat was hiding under my bed and crying. This was the first time I had ever seen her up close. The entire time that I was staying there, up to that point, she never left my host's bedroom. Again, I ignored the weird feeling I had. I assumed that she had decided that I was okay, and then shortly after I went to bed. However, I did start locking my bedroom door that night. I also remember about halfway through that night that I thought I heard someone walking around in the gravel outside of my window. But after listening for a bit, I didn't hear anything else and went back to sleep. The morning after, I still felt a bit odd, but I kept up with my plans for the day. I drove out to a small music festival happening in Sonoma, and then I went clothes shopping after. Overall, I had a great day. When I got back to the house, though, I found that the front door had been locked in a way that I hadn't left it. Basically, my hosts never locked the deadbolt, only the lower locks and that's the only locks that my key worked on. So I never messed with a deadbolt, but it was definitely locked. So I had to call my hosts and find the hidden key, which to their credit safety-wise, was buried a whole foot underneath a bush outside, and had definitely not been unearthed for a long time. So I used it when inside, and kept the key with me just in case it happened again. And it did but with a different door. This time, I stepped out into the garage to grab a drink. When I turned around to go back into the house, the door was shut and locked. I could use my normal key on that door, but I was still pretty bewildered. My own cats are whack, so I think my mind was trying to come up with a way that the cats could be locking me out of the house, but I was coming up empty. I decided that I simply didn't understand how the locks worked, and I just wrote it off and started double-checking locks whenever I left the house or went into the garage. That night, when I went to bed, that awful feeling of unease was still there. And so was the shy cat, who was clearly unhappy to see me, but also wouldn't leave my room. I ended up just locking my bedroom door and went to sleep. The next morning I felt awful. I was nauseous and my body was aching. I had no desire to leave the house that day. So I decided just to stay in and Netflix. This vacation stay was a full two weeks. So I didn't feel like I was in a hurry to get all my touristy things in anyways. But as the day went on, I started to get that feeling of wrongness again, and it morphed into feeling incredibly watched. Around mid-afternoon, it got to the point where I was so uneasy, and even feeling the way that I did, I decided to get out of the house for a bit to shake it off. I was getting low on food, so I went to the local grocery store and bought a few items that I didn't think would upset my stomach, and as I started to leave the checkout, the cashier said a generic, have a great evening. And I just instantly started crying, shocking myself and the poor cashier. I just had this intrusive thought that said, you might be the last person to ever say that to me. When I got to the car, I was still crying and my entire body did not want me to drive back to the house. But how could I not? I couldn't just neglect the cats. So I ended up driving back parked in the driveway, and convinced myself after about a half hour just to go open the front door. Once I did that, I thought I would get over it and maybe go inside and at least feed the cats and maybe get a hotel room after or something. But my body physically would not let me inside. 
It was like I was stuck in the entryway. I then made a deal with myself. I would yell into the house, saying that I had already called the police and that they were on the way. In panic logic, I figured that if anyone was there, that would make them leave. So I faced the inside of the house, looking down the hallway towards the bedrooms, and I did just that. The second I finished saying, They're almost here, so if you don't want to be arrested, you should leave now. The light in the master bedroom turned on, and I heard some banging. I immediately hightailed it back to my car, called the police for real, and then proceeded to have a mental breakdown while talking to the dispatcher. Once they got there, they checked the house, but didn't find anyone. However, the double doors in my host's bedroom were left wide open, and there was a pile of food wrappers in the corner behind the blinds, so they said it looked like someone had been there. What makes this so scary is that nothing was taken. Additionally, from that bedroom was the perfect vantage point to see me in the living room as I was watching TV. The police told me that there wasn't much else that they could do, and there were no signs of forced entry. Also, we couldn't get a hold of the homeowners right away. Later on, once they got back from Hawaii, they did verify that nothing had been taken. Once the police left, the shy cat disappeared back into the master bedroom, and I didn't see her again until I left to go back home. I think the intruder had been there for at least two days forcing the cat to choose between two strangers, leading her to choose the one that was a little less strange. I still had to stay in that house for the next three days. Nothing else odd happened, and I didn't feel that something was off for the rest of my time there, but the damage was done. This situation messed me up pretty bad, especially since they didn't catch the person. Since that vacation, I've never felt completely safe in a home without doing a complete search before bed. I'm extremely glad that I trusted my instincts. I guess I would rather have some residual anxiety than be dead. <laughs>